Pam Marcucci. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Corporate Development, Training, and Communications. I'd like to welcome everyone to the intern presentations and to take advantage of the fact that this is our fifth internship cohort. And I'm going to take advantage of that to tell you the top five reasons that the Jacobs Institute values its summer internship program and its interns. First, smart, motivated minds are fun to have around, and they add energy to an already pretty energized environment. The interns offer an alternative perspective, and they ask different questions. Number two, the interns help us explore solutions and improvements that directly impact our pro program and services. For, exa for example, Tom figured out how to build and use new testing equipment to validate the mechanical properties of our 3D printed vascular models. Liam experimented with placing sensors on our models to quantitatively measure changes in flow and pressure when blood clots are removed. Number three, they mentor high school interns and help out with our BNMC-wide STEM program ninth graders. This thereby perpetuates our summer intern Ponzi scheme, where we have interns who are interns for interns. Liam led a biometrics activity with both groups, helping them make scarily realistic replicas of their fingers. Maya taught Dr. Davies interns how to do big data stuff that I can't even articulate. <laughs> um, number four, they fall down, but they get right back up. They inspire us with their resilience and their ability to learn from obstacles. Liam found that the sensors he was using were not the ones he needed. He was dejected for about, about a minute, and then he was set to work to finding the appropriate sensors. Rachel had to unravel a complicated combination of topics and work to distill the central focus of her project, but she, she never got discouraged. And during his first week, Tom found a way to make the models absorb less water by accident. Number five. This year, the interns have helped us help the JI to deepen and in some cases create relationships with other entities. Maya's big data project brought together the brain power of Dr. Tom Ferlani and Bob DeLeon of UB Center for Computational Research, Dr. Jason Davies of UB Neurosurgery, and experts at the Jacobs School of Medicine's Institute for Healthcare Economics, Informatics, sorry, not to mention Dr. Davies interns, Marvelous from West Virginia, Duck from UB Med School, and Jimmy from the Park School of Buffalo. David and Kristen's project explored the integration of sensors in 3D printed models, and they worked with Dr. Ka Kalinovich at UB School of Engineering to explore the possibility of doing that with single step manufacturing. They also incorporated feedback from Dr. Kim, an electrophysiologist, and Dr. Snyder, a neurosurgeon. Working with Moog and the Blockchain Resource Group, Rachel explored the similarity and differences between Moog's point of use manufacturing capability using 3D printing and its potential use by the JI. She also demystified the blockchain for me. In fact, there should be a number six. They teach us a lot. So now I'm going to turn the program over to Maya, Tom, Liam, Kristen, David, and Rachel with wholehearted thanks for all the brain power, learning, and energy that you've brought us this summer. So Maya. All right, good afternoon. My name is Maya Reed McDaniel. I am a graduate student at the University of Buffalo studying data science, and today I will be speaking with all of you about data science and electronic medical record data. So now, before I begin, anyone here like watching Netflix? Yeah. All right, all right. So now, does anyone here think they have a pretty solid idea of what data science entails? Okay, so not as many hands. So I'm here to tell you that if you like watching Netflix, you guys have already been exposed to some of the key ideas that we use in data science. For example, you turn on your Netflix and you already have some suggestions going. What is that about? What Netflix uses is what we call a classic example of a recommender system. It looks at the similarities between different TV shows and movies and your ratings of them to suggest what they think would be best based on your preferences. Let's take another example. Let's say you go and you search for a show like The Office. And what you realize is that the US version comes up before the UK version. Why is that? Well, this is a perfect example of search engine optimization. Behind the scenes, there's a ranking algorithm that goes through all of your search results and presents them to you in a way that Netflix has found to be optimal based on their data. 
So by now you guys are probably wondering, what do the Netflix and the JI have in common? Well, both hope to leverage the data that they have to gain insights and improve their outcomes. Here at the JI, we're hoping to improve patient outcomes, specifically for those who have strokes. My summer project has been focused on creating better stroke prediction models. We're doing this here at the JI in collaboration with the UB Center for Computational Research, Dr. Jason Davies Research Group, and my co-collaborator, Jimmy Mao. We're doing this by using electronic medical record data so that we can identify which of our patients are at highest risk for stroke. We want to do this so that we can work proactively rather than reactively in creating intervention plans. This way, we can hopefully save some lives. So now, what data are we working with? The data set I'm presenting to you guys today is called the MIMIC3 database. All you guys need to know is that it's electronic medical record data for about 30 or excuse me, 40,000 patients collected at Beth Israel Deakinese Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts between 2001 and 2012. So this data is clinical data, lab data, and demographic data. So now, what is our data? How are we getting it? How are we processing it? This data is what's called open source, which means that it's freely available for use. What we do is we download the data in a series of files, and we put it into what's called the database management system. So now when we take this data, it's hosted on servers down at the CCR, and we, the clients of this database, send out a series of what we call SQL commands. These are basic programs that ask questions like, hey, can you pull down each of my patients and whether or not they have hypertension? So we write a series of these commands, take these results, and this is what we use to build our models. So now, this is where the magic happens. I'll save you guys the details, but I'm more than happy to speak with anyone after about them. Basically, this is what you guys need to know. Our data is a series of rows representing individual patients and columns with features about these patients. For example, age, ethnicity, whether or not they have hypertension. We have one column that has whether or not each patient has had a stroke. What we do with this data is we present it to an algorithm. What the algorithm does is it looks at relationships and trends between our features and whether or not a patient has a stroke. From this, we generate a model. Now, once we get a model, we need to be able to evaluate it. Because if it's not a great model, we don't want to use it. What we do is we take an independent set of patients, present this to the model with all of the same features except for one. Now the model doesn't know whether or not a patient is going to have a stroke. We make the model do that hard work. So from this, we get a prediction for each and every patient. But in our back pocket, we know the true label for each patient because we have access to their electronic medical records. So what we do is we take this predictive value and this true value and we compare them and that's how we evaluate our models. So this is what I did and this is what we found. So the model that we created had a test accuracy of about 76%, which as we like to say is better than a coin flip. What I got, want you guys to pay attention to on the first diagram here are the three lines I have labeled. Line A is for the perfect model. This is exactly what we want to see. Line B is for a more realistic model. And line C is a model that we don't really want. It's no better than a random guess. In the second diagram, we have the results from our model. As you can see, quite a bit better than a random guess. So this is something to be proud of. All right, so by now you guys are probably wondering, is this the best you guys can do? Of course not. This is just the foundation for a project that we have a lot of faith in. What we hope to do is incorporate more data, for example, geographic data, to help enrich our models. We also have access to what are called physician text notes. So these are the notes that the physician might write in your chart that has personal data about you with a lot of detail. We hope to extract even more features from these. And then finally, we hope to create more complex models, so two-tier models and deep learning models, all with the hope of increasing our predictive accuracy. All right, so let's bring it home. Why do this here at the Jacobs Institute? As a data scientist, I have worked very closely this summer with researchers, clinicians, and engineers. There is virtually no place else in the world where I could do this. My work here and my experiences are just a microcosm of what this building represents. On the first four floors of this building, we have the Gates Vascular Institute. Here on the fifth floor, we have the Jacobs Institute. And above us, we have the Clinical and Translational Research Center of UB. This interdisciplinary approach that we have here 
to treating vascular disease is what's helping us propel the advancements that we're also proud of. So now, if I could present to all of you the perfect algorithm that with 100% accuracy will tell me whether or not someone has a stroke, that's great. But at the end of the day, we still need to be able to treat these strokes. That's why we need to continue to train the best clinical staff and create the best medical devices possible. And that is something that we are excellent at doing here at the JI. So for more on that, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Tom Mancuso. But I thank you all for your time. All right, so thank you, Maya, great job. So as she said, my name is Tom Mancuso. I'm currently a rising junior at Ohio State. This summer, my goal was to find a way to be able to characterize our models. So here, we have three different examples of some of the models that we print here at the JI. Here, we have our intracranial models. We have our arch models. And here are our coronary models. So these models are 3D printed using a special polymer. They can even be created patient specific based on scans taken from right downstairs. You can take a look at these and pass them around. These models are currently considered the best in the world. But here at the JI, we know that we can make them even better. Our ultimate goal is to be able to take these and be able to use our models for clinical product testing. So how they work is we hook up pumps down at the connections down here. We then pump water through our models in order to simulate the vascular system. So what you're looking at here is a side-by-side -side comparison of our models under x-ray on the left versus what a doctor sees when they take an x-ray of a patient downstairs in the cath lab. As you can see, they are almost indistinguishable from one another. That's one of the reasons why our models work so well. One of the only drawbacks of our models, though, is the support material that it takes to print. We have two types of support material that we use at the JI. We have Vera White and Full Cure. All of this material down here is support material. It's even on the inside of these tubes. You have to crumble and tear it all away in order to clean them up so that it can be ready to use. When printing, we also have an option. If we want to print with our matte support grid or our gloss support grid, the matte support grid covers everything with support material, where the gloss only puts support material where it's absolutely necessary. So, how did our models become the best in the world? Essentially, this man, Dr. Siddiqui, tested our models and said that they were great. <laughs> Eventually, other physicians tried them and came to the same conclusion that the best models were found right here at the Jacobs Institute. But what really makes our models the best? That's where I come in. Right before I arrived, the Jacobs Institute purchased a lot of equipment and gave me this project, which I've outlined here. The first thing we decided was what properties that we wanted to know about our models. We decided that lubricity, tensile strength, as well as clarity were the three properties that we wanted to know. So it was up to me to take all this equipment we've, pur we've purchased and create some machines in order to test for these properties. Where I actually spent most of my time this summer is in testing the accuracy of these machines. So you, be th you might be thinking, these are brand new state-of-the-art machines which I built. Why do I need to test the accuracy of the machines? Well, think of these machines like a self-driving Tesla. Tesla already has the technology for self-driving cars. So why aren't they readily available on the market? It's because Tesla, the self-driving car, still puts lives at risk and it's not exactly 100% perfect. What they're doing right now is they're testing their cars and getting feedback. 
with that feedback, they're taking that to improve their cars until they're perfect. I needed to follow that exact process with the machines that I built. When I got them, they weren't exactly perfect, so I tested with them. After I tested with them, I tore them apart, redesigned, and remanufactured them until the, I got to the finished product and they were perfect. So without further ado, here are the two machines I was able to create. On the left here, we have the Lubricity Tester, which was made in co collaboration with our partners at Nagorider. Nagorider did a great job of creating the framework, the motors, and the circuitry within this machine. When I tested with it, it wasn't exactly perfect. So what I ended up doing is I had to order parts and even 3D print custom parts in order to make the machine perfect. On the right there is the tensile tester. The tensile tester, when I arrived, was just a bunch of random equipment purchased from different places on the internet. I was able to help build it from the ground up to the finished product that you see here. Here is a quick demo of the lubricity tester in action. So essentially, these two arms clamp down on our model, which is right here in the center. A motor then raises our model up a little bit and allows the stainless steel rod to rub against the in inner wall of our model. That creates a force, which is read by this gauge here. After a few simple calculations, it allows you to get the coefficient for friction, as well as these beautiful looking graphs. So right now, you might be asking yourself, what is lubricity? Lubricity is the measurement of the reduction of friction. Friction, as many of you may know, is the force that opposes motion of one object sliding on another. To help explain it a little bit clear, I'm using Buffalo native Patrick Kane here. So as you can see, he can stick handle very quickly on the ice. That is because ice has a very high lubricity. If he tried doing the same thing on concrete, it wouldn't work. Concrete has a much lower lubricity. That's why when kids play street hockey, they use a ball instead of a puck. So now that you have a little bit more of an idea of what lubricity is, here was some of the data that I was able to collect. Essentially, in summary, our lubricity started off very high in our models, but reduced for about two hours, after about two hours, to where it plateaued. I'll get to why it does this in a minute. So, now you might be asking yourself, what is tensile strength? Tensile strength is the ability for an object to resist being pulled apart. And to help explain that, I have one of my favorite childhood toys, Stretch Armstrong. So, as you can see as advertised, Stretch Armstrong. Stretch him and he returns to his normal size. But me, as a kid, I wasn't interested in that. What I would do is I'd use my toes to step on his toes and pull him as hard as I could until he broke. <laughs> and now I'm crying because my favorite toy is broken. I use this exact same principle when creating the tensile tester. We do the same exact thing, clamp it on both sides and stretch our models until they broke. This time, I was able to collect data points and create this nice graph. So essentially, our models have an elastic region which is when you pull Stretch Armstrong and his arm returns to normal size. They have a plastic region, which is when you pull Stretch Armstrong, but you stretch him a little too far and his arms kind of dangles and because you stretched him out too far. It doesn't return to normal. And finally here, we have the break point, which is exactly what it sounds like. His arm completely flies off. So the last thing that I looked at was clarity. But you can't look at the clarity of our models without talking about water absorption. So what you're looking at here are some thinly sliced cross-sectional areas of our model with different exposure times to water. What you can see here is water starts absorbing through where the support material was. It's then able to penetrate our models through that. Not only does this create our models become cloudy and eventually fully white, this is what was causing the lubricity to increase during that span of two hours. So why do these mechanical properties matter? As I said before, our goal is to get our models so we can use them for clinical product testing. Another reason why is with product testing right now, 
we typically use glass and silicone tubes. But they're not, they don't have the similar properties as the human vascular system. So the data collected from them isn't very good. Another reason why is because they are useful for training physicians. My dad once told me that you practice how you play. So if you practice using a cruddy model, chances are when you're finally operating on a patient, you're going to carry over some of those bad habits that you learned practicing on the bad models. So where do we go from here? From here, we can use the standard operating procedures as well as the machines that I created to help get our models from where they are now to being able to clinically test with them. Once we do this, we can take it even a step further to where we can put sensors on the outside of our models. But for that, I'll pass the mic over to Liam, because that was the basis of his project. Sorry, folks, the seamless mic transfer wasn't perfect. <laughs> As he said, my name's Liam Christie, and I'm a rising junior electrical engineering student at UB, and my project focused on putting sensors into our model. So I wanted to start this talk off with a completely unrelated piece of technology, and that piece of technology, the cell phone. I think we all realize that our cell phone is something that we use every single day. But do you really realize how much it's changed in the few years you've had one? In my case, I got my first cell phone in eighth grade, and it was the one you see up here, the LG Shine. And let me tell you, this cell phone was a work of art. It had a mirror on the front. You could see other stuff. It was great. And it's amazing that you see in the 10 years since I got that cell phone, I have went from something like an LG Shine to an iPhone X something extremely different in technology, in what I like to call this a technology boom. Even you see something like touchpad display changing to a limitless display. Crazy technology difference there. And that's what you're seeing in the neurospace currently. So similar to the LG Shine, we started off with TPA, a chemical clot busting drug that was only successful 10 to 50% of the time. Think about that, ridiculous. In a matter of years, through a bunch of innovation, we came out with mechanical removal of clots, literally from inside your body. That alone increased that 10 to 50% to 90%. Crazy, technology boom. And now you think, what allows this to happen? But to help explain that, I wanted to introduce my friend here, Rob. And you know, Rob's a smart caveman, and he has an issue. He needs to move rocks from one point to another. But how does he do this? Well, Rob being the smart, engineering caveman he is, comes up with a couple wheel ideas, even thinks of the name. And he comes up with four separate ideas. And he comes square, circle, and he goes through a series of testing and multiple iterations of each. And he figures out that the circular wheel is what's going to help him get his rocks from the beginning to the end. That's exactly what we do here in the Jacobs Institute I2R. It's amazing what we're able to do when companies come in with either a new product a product that has been through FDA approval. And they get our space, and they're able to take that to the next level. What the I2R allows is, oh, let me explain this, idea to reality, I2R. <laughs> what it allows is it gives the funding, the expertise from both clinicians and engineers, the testing space, and the top of the line models, as Tom explained, for them to test their devices in. Before I go into product testing, I wanted to outline a couple of main neurosurgery devices for you. So the first one is going to be the medical aspiration catheter, which I'm going to hand out to you now. But I'm going to tell you, be very careful, because this is about the cost of my tuition right here. <laughs> there you go. All right. Now, when I want you to think about this, think about the shop vac. What the shop vac does is it sucks liquid back and reverses flow. The medical aspiration catheter does the same exact thing, but inside the body. It goes inside your arteries and sucks blood flow back. That's all I want you to think of. 
The second is going to be the medical stent retriever. Same thing about these. Please be careful. <laughs> the medical stent retriever, when you think about this, think about the turbo snake. I don't know how many of you have seen the commercial, but the idea is you're sending the turbo snake down your pipe to grab hair. Well, the medical aspiration cath, oh, sorry, stent retriever does the same exact thing. It goes into your arteries and pulls out clots. It's actually amazing that we're even able to do something like this. So I talked a little bit about product testing, but what actually is it? It's us providing a space for people to catalyze their products and take them to the next level in what I feel is really one of the most improved and high-tech product testing areas in the world. So you think about it. What we do is we bring in a surgeon like Dr. Siddiqui, world-renowned for medical and neurosurgery. And what he does is he tests a baseline product, something he'd use downstairs in the cath lab or in the OR. He tests that device and then he gives it a number on a scale of one to five. Three usually being for the baseline because that's your average. So he gives you a three on all your scores for that. And then you bring in that new product from the company, that innovative piece of technology, whether that be a prototype or an FDA approved device. And Dr. Siddiqui runs that through the same exact model under the same exact parameters. He rates that on a scale of one to five. Great, something that's never been able to be done before. The ability to rate a device through a world-renowned surgeon. That is why everyone comes to the Jacobs Institute. But an issue you might see, one to five scale, that's not great. To me, that doesn't sound that great. And I'll go into that in a little bit, but first, this is the setup of product testing. And the idea here is we want to set up an OR environment for engineers, for people who would never experience an OR environment to see with their device. So you're going to see you have your devices, your saline bags, your code, which I'll talk about in a little bit, your x-ray, your display, your thrombectomy model, your cardiac pump, and your medical expertise, the most important part in product testing. And then a little bit more on the model, you have your clot and then the two flow sensors that I have attached on there, which I also talk about in a little bit. So going into those flow sensors, this is just about five minutes of data from both of those flow sensors scrolling by in front of you. Insane. The fact that we used to have to go through this data, Karen and Reese, two engineers at the Jacobs Institute, had to go through this data and graph this and quantify it for our engineering customers. Well, what I'm doing is eliminating the need for that. My code, which I'll go into, allows you to see this in a display. How did I do it? Well, I used a coding language called LabVIEW, something I'd never had experience to before I got to the Jacobs Institute. Out of college, I came with this knowledge. This is C code that you might normally see scrolling through on a computer on Netflix or whatever. And this is just 40 lines of code from what you'd see in a normal averaging over a whole grouping of numbers. I did that exact code, which took me three hours in my C code class in 30 seconds in LabVIEW. Crazy idea that we're able to make this an intuitive system and make this number, this 40 lines of code, into just three boxes. I think it's absolutely amazing. Let me tell you, when I first got to the Jacobs Institute, and they told me I had a coding project. I was so scared. This class was terrible. I did not enjoy it. But once I learned it, once I got those technicalities down, I was able to make code like this no problem. And this is the end product. A couple slides ago, I showed you a bunch of numbers scrolling past you. This is all of those numbers in a display. So what my code does is it takes in data from the sensors, it takes in data from thermometers and in the future pressure, and it displays those for you. So what you see here, and I'll point to both sides so it's fair, temperature, and then you have four graphs here. So on the left, the ones that are kind of hard to see because of the light, I'm sorry, are going to be your flow before the clot. So those are the, that's the big sensor I showed before the clot, and on the right, the white graph is going to be your flow after the clot. Major things here, you see a waveform on the bottom because that's going with heart rate. On the top, that's just an average of this waveform. Amazing that we're able to quantify this and the, honestly, the things are unlimited to what we could do with this in product testing. So, product testing, this is an example. 
a common procedure that's done when removing a clot, opening a stent. And what they do, what Dr. Siddiqui does, is when he's in the OR, he'll open a stent when he thinks he's passed or inside of the clot. And what happens is that stent that I passed around expands. And when it expands, they call it a breath of fresh air to the brain. And think about that. It's releasing blood to the brain, but they've never been able to quantify how much goes to the brain. It could just be a small amount of flow. It could be a ton of flow. It could be 80%, 20%. You never know how much is restored. Well, after I point out these things, so you see your medical stent here, your clot, catheter that I passed around, my flow sensor. You can see that we were able to quantify that. As he's pulling back this catheter and it's opening up on the clot, you can actually see the restoration of flow that happens in the arteries. Something that's absolutely amazing, never been quantified before. And we are doing it here at the Jacobs Institute. My code is doing it here at the Jacobs Institute. And this takes you from that LG shine phase to that iPhone X. How do we get there? We do this. Stuff like this, our projects. And that alone is going to take you from that 1 to 5 scaling that the doctors usually use to quantifiable number. So to wrap it up, I wanted to compare two things for you. This is an example of the coronary space in a timeline from 1945. Now I'll let you know the coronary space has been around a lot longer than 1945. This is just a quick example. This is the neurospace. As you can see, not even until 1975 did we really start treating these strokes. Absurd that they had even happened. But to bring you back to my original analogy, this is what you're going to see with the two spaces. The coronary space started way before 1945, but at 1945 hit that LG shine phase. You know, it was great when it was there, but has since progressed with a boom to the iPhone X. Well, the neurospace started with the first phone in 1985. We're just getting to that point where we're able to remove these clots, but there's so much places to move, and our projects are what allow that to happen. With that, I'm going to hand off to Chris in here, and she's going to present on her heart. My name is Kristen Benson, and I'm a rising senior at the University at Buffalo studying biomedical engineering. This summer, I had the opportunity to bring 3D models of the heart to life. We're here on the fifth floor because the bottom four floors are Gates Vascular Institute. Gates Vascular Institute treats cardiovascular surgery, uh, has cardiovascular surgeries happening every day. The reason why they're able to have these surgeries happening is because there's a ginormous need to treat them. In fact, cardiac disease is the number one killer in the United States. What's even more overwhelming is number three, estimated by Johns Hopkins University, medical error. The raw truth is that doctors do not get enough training before they enter the OR. This summer, I had the opportunity to shadow Dr. Kim, one of the best cardiologists in the world. I watched him treat a patient with atrial fibrillation in the endovascular lab. He was able to do this with only catheters inserted in the femoral artery, and he had minimally invasive incisions here, which was incredible to me. But even the best cardiologist has his struggles in the operating room, and that's why he came to the JI. He wanted a model that's going to allow him to see location in the left atria, which is where he's usually treating these problems. And that's where I come in. In order to understand how to create a training model, I had to understand the current models here at the Jacobs Institute. These models are coronary models, which are great at showing the vasculature, but they aren't so great at showing the intricacy of the heart as a whole. So in order to do this, I had to understand how the heart works. Well, there's two main pumps. On the right side, there's deoxygenated blood coming from the organs and tissues that enters the heart and brings it to the lungs. On the left side, it takes oxygenated blood from the lungs and sends it to the rest of the body. These pumps work because cardiac muscle contracts. But how does the cardiac muscle know to contract? 
That's because the heart has its own electrical conductivity system, all started at the SA node. The SA node sends a voltage across all the electrical highways and stimulates the cardiac muscle to contract. This is called cardiac electrophysiology, which is what Dr. Kim is treating downstairs. And this is what I had to model. Now the surgery looks a little something like this. The doctor will go in through the femoral artery, enter the aortic arch, oops, enter the aortic arch, enter the right atria, puncture over to the left atria, and then they'll insert a mapping catheter. The mapping catheter allows the cardiologist to see where these bad voltages and bad signals are coming from. And once these signals are located, he goes in with another specialized catheter and ablates or burns the tissue. By burning the tissue, the signal is no longer able to be stimulated in that spot, which stops the fluttering. Fluttering is a problem because it causes blood to pool in the left atria. And when it pools, it causes clots. And those clots can turn into stroke if it is sent and broken off. So this was my goal to create in a more visual model for Dr. Kim and other future cardiologists. And this is how I did it. First, I started by printing the Jacobs Institute first heart model. Now, obviously it's broken here, but I had to do this in order to create a cardiac electrophysiology model because I have to insert a bunch of electric signals into the left atria there, which is a very small area to work with. So how did I integrate signals and sensors into this model? Well, I did that through using conductive ink. Conductive ink is essentially a paintable wire that adheres to our models very well. And this conductive ink allows us to send signals right into the heart if I'm painting it on the heart, which is what I ended up doing. So with this technology, I was able to create the Jacobs Institute's first cardiac electrophysiology model of the heart. On the left, on the left, you see my mapping catheter that I created. And once that mapping catheter touches the conductive ink, it completes the circuit. And once the circuit is completed, it lights up an LED on my display there on the right. And that LED corresponds to the exact location you are in the left atria, which is exactly what Dr. Kim wanted. And here it is in action. Now, I proved that electronics can be integrated into our models here at the JI, but what does that mean for the future? To me, that means there's endless possibilities. Your body's a moving system. With electronics, we can introduce motors and moving parts, but also we know that the heart has its own electronic circuit. So if we improve that, we can improve device testing in the heart and create more lifelike models for the Jacobs Institute and for the world. And to talk about the future of these models, I would like to introduce David. My name is David Marr. I'm a rising senior at Duquesne University. Uh, I study biomedical engineering. And I'm excited to share with you my work this summer on manufacturing in the future of medicine. So let me ask, have you ever considered how your phone is created? How about the car that you drove here in today? How is that manufactured? Henry Ford revolutionized the field of manufacturing with the assembly line. It's a process that creates a part combined with another part to form a product that serves a function. Essentially everything around us requires some degree of assembly. 3D printing has completely changed how manufacturing is done in, in the modern day. It allows us to create any complex shape that we might be interested in making in nearly any size and any material properties. Not to mention, we can do this faster than we've ever been able to do it before. What if we could use this tool of 3D printing to completely eliminate the assembly line? What if I told you we could 3D print completely finished products requiring no post-process attention? 
incorporating embedded electronic capabilities, artificial intelligence, non-assembly solutions. What if I told you we could invent the next generation of manufacturing technology? If we want to reinvent the way manufacturing is done, well, we need to develop new technology to change the way that we're doing things right now. My work this summer focused on the design of a brand new hybrid 3D printing system. Now you may be wondering, why do we want to deviate from the state-of-the-art technology that we have across the hall for 3D printing? Well, we wanted to focus on creating a system that, that was focused on our particular application of printing vascular models, rather than designing our models and our process based on the capabilities of the current technology that exists. We want to be the pioneers in creating the new technology that brings us from where we are right now to where we want to be. The JI is the perfect place to make this kind of next generational technology a reality with the resources of research above us and clinical experts below. We call this innovation through collaboration. I took a deep dive into everything that this versatile environment had to offer. I met extensively with JI engineers to understand what are our capabilities and how do we use those to create the most realistic and, and reliable vascular models that exist. I met with clinical experts. I shadowed cardiac electrophysiology and endovascular neurosurgical cases to understand what's the need for 3D printing in the medical space. And as we do best here, we partnered. We collaborated with experts in other disciplines, specifically Dr. Kalinovic from the University of Buffalo and his company, Flexible Robotic Environment. We saw value in involving every single party that could help make this disruptive technology a reality. Our current process for producing patient-specific vascular models involves polyjet 3D printing. We use patient scans to segment out the structures that we intend to build, and our 3D printers bring them to life through layer-by-layer -layer additive manufacturing. These machines deposit tiny liquid polymer resin droplets, and they're solidified to particular flexible properties, almost like a rubber, by the use of ultraviolet light. What I learned about our process is it has its fair share of deficiencies and limitations. We wanted to narrow our scope on exactly what these limitations were so that we could set the stage for turning our deficiencies into brand new capabilities. Similar to how bridges require support beneath them to maintain their desired position and performance, our 3D models are no different. As Tom outlined for us, all of our within and under all of our uh, complex vascular models, we need removable support material, which is designed to dissolve in water. Unfortunately, these models don't come off the 3D printer looking like finished products. This is what the process looks like to produce one vascular model. On a low end, it can be up to 60 hours to produce one of these access neurothrombectomy models, depending on its dimensions. In one year, we could produce from 100 to 150 models a year. That could be 10,000 hours in production, 5,000 of which takes place after the 3D print comes off the print bed. Half of our costs are coming from things that take place after our 3D printer is done doing its work. Now, when I refer to post-processing, I want you to focus on this part right here. All of the time and effort that goes into making our models what they are after the 3D printer is done doing what it's supposed to do. Now, if we're going to design a new system, new technology, we first need to figure out what are the correct problems to solve. Now, we took a two-phase approach to this, phase one being addressing our current processing deficiencies, starting with the fact that things in nature, the human body, is not made in layers. Introducing water-soluble support material has its own cascade of performance issues, starting with lack of transparency and problems with water absorption and mechanical properties constantly changing where this water-soluble support material once was. Beyond that, that's a problem because all of our devices that we're testing, no two devices are being tested on the same exact baseline model. We need a more reliable, a more consistent, a more repeatable method for testing devices that are going to ultimately end up being used in patients like you and me in the operating room. Beyond that, we didn't want to just make a system that would improve how we're doing things now. We wanted to take things to the next level. 
We wanted to, as, as Kristen proved, incorporate electronics, the ability to quantify how well our devices are working in disease states and vascular models. And most importantly, we needed our, our 3D prints to be verified throughout the building process, so that if we ever hope to scale this technology beyond just the walls of the JI, to get in the hands of device engineers and companies to get products to the market faster, we need to have the ability to create finished products off of the print bed. So how are we going to do that? Imagine painting a fence. That can be a time-consuming process because you need to apply paint on all sides of an object that's in a fixed position. By incorporating the capabilities of robotic freedom, we're able to 3D print objects in a non-fixed orientation. This gives us both flexibility and versatility. It allows us to create structures and geometries that we couldn't do without if we were just doing traditional layer by layer manufacturing. Beyond that, robotic freedom allows us to print, 3D print our vascular models without the use of support material. Now, this enables us to have no post-processing requirements after the fact if we're printing without support material. There's currently, if we were able to print complex and accurate 3D geometries without the use of removable support material, this would transform the additive manufacturing world. So how are we going to do this? One way that we can make this happen is by concentrating laser energy on a particular point so that we could control the material properties of our build, the, the hardness, the structural integrity of our build on a microscopic level. We can do this by, we can create structures that support themselves in, cl in crucial stress regions using background machine learning algorithms so that we can still maintain the flexibility necessary for the vascular structure while requiring no support material for the model to support itself. This technology, there's currently no commercial technology in 3D printing that requires absolutely no post-production post attention. This would revolutionize the role of 3D printing in medicine. So we didn't want, just want to create a model that would improve how we're doing things now. We, we wanted to create something more than just an arena representing human anatomy. As my peers proved, the concept of incorporating sensors has value and flexible electronics can, can take these 3D prints to the next level. That's something that we need to bring to life in an automated way. So imagine th having the ability to 3D print, bringing circuits to life. I'm talking about 3D printing functional electronics. All of this in line with lubricity application. Verification methods, inline verification methods, so, you don't, so we can do offline manufacturing. All of this taking place in a seamless design of non-assembly solutions. The value of technology like this is massive in both physician training and device testing. If we can get this process of 3D printing down to a point where there's no post-production att attention necessary, we can get these 3D models in the hands of device engineers and people that can use models without having to spend any time after the fact worrying about getting them to become anatomically real. If we can have training physicians train on these models, become comfortable navigating complex anatomy with surgical devices, that has huge value. If we have functional electronics incorporated in our models, what's to say that we can't have these models simulate catastrophe in an operation prior to that happening in real time? For device testing, if we can get this technology in the right hands, what's to say that not every single tiny device idea, no matter how small, no matter how crazy it might be, will have the same fair opportunity to get flushed out, investigated to its fullest extent? And if you know, just one of those device ideas ends up saving just one life, then all of what we're doing proves worth it. This is what comes of a place that encourages partnerships, encourages thinking outside the box. It shows us not only what's possible, but what the fact that we're on the bleeding edge of making this next generational technology a reality. With that, I'd like to pass it off to my colleague Rachel as she shares how we can take this technology to the next level and scale it to define the future of medicine. Thank you.
Good afternoon, and thank you guys for all being here today. My name is Rachel, and I am honored to be standing in front of you today to talk about my summer internship experience at the Jacobs Institute. Like any presentation, you give it a title, but my title does not begin to explain the experience that I have had here this summer. As an MBA student, I expected to come into the Jacobs Institute, be given a project, and then expected to have something at the end of nine weeks. By week eight, my mentor made it very clear to me that I was not going to have this. This is the internship experience here at the Jacobs Institute, and it is my pleasure to discuss with you the future of medicine. So take a look at this building. When you walked in today, did you notice anything special about it? Was it unique? Did you feel like you were even in Buffalo? I bring this up today because this has been a very important part of my project. Envisioned by Dr. Hopkins, who is here with us today, this building makes the unimaginable imaginable. Now, I'd like to shift your focus for just a moment. Take a look at this woman on the screen. Imagine it's your mother or your grandmother. She's been recently diagnosed with a severe neurological condition. The medical team decides that they are going to need to intervene before any further complications could happen. Thoughts begin rushing through your mind. What's going to happen? Are the doctors competent enough to treat it? Will they be able to deal with any complications that could arise? Physicians are very competent people who go through years of extensive training. But unfortunately, no two patients are the same. And this time, it's your loved one. So by a show of hands, how many people are afraid of flying? How many people ever worry about a pilot's training before they get on a plane? If you look around, there's a few hands that go up. Now let me ask you, how many people are afraid of having surgery? If you look around, there's many more hands that go up. With the help of our industry partnerships, I have been able to learn more from other high-risk industries that are able to train before it's showtime. So if you turn your attention to the left side of the screen here, you see a simulator. These simulators are used in the aviation industry to train pilots. They simulate what, pilot, or what flying is like real time. It helps to emulate what flying is like and what complications could occur. Now turn your attention to the right side of the screen. The image you see here is what, how training is done in medicine. You have a physician doing a procedure with students, residents, or fellows standing by the bedside to learn. Standing by the bedside to learn. Although there are simulators that are used in medicine, these simulators do not closely resemble patients. Therefore, we still use the see one, do one, teach one methodology in, methodology in medicine. Therefore, the first step in learning how to improve this was for me to understand the device development process. I did this by shadowing physicians in the operating room, talking with our engineers, and getting feedback. The process you see up here on the screen is the process that every company must go through in order to develop a device. Right now, many companies come to the JI to test their devices. They come here because they know the JI has the resources to make these products come to life. We can help companies define the products and create this vision for them. So how are we going to improve the way that physicians train and devices are developed? As vascular medicine, as vascular disease continues to be a huge problem, especially, especially here in Buffalo, we see that as an opportunity for the JI to spread their wings. We hope that we can provide these patient-specific lifelike models in the early stages of training to help, that these, to help these device developers to create better devices that will hopefully improve physician training as well as patient outcomes. Therefore, the next step in the process was for me to learn through collaboration. This meant in mid-July, I would go to the Moog Additive Manufacturing Facility right in Elma, New York, to learn how they're using 3D printing. <coughs> My mentor told me this summer that the aviation and the aerospace industry had a lot of parallels with medicine. 
I agreed with him, but it wasn't quite clear to me until I went on this visit and learned from Moog to understand how they are optimizing 3D printing technology to produce verified and trusted parts to be used. So let's take a look at the process that they're using today. First, there's a request. That request is then sent to the manufacturing facility where they use 3D <coughs> metal printers to print them. They then verify that the part is accurate. They sell that product, pack it up, and ship it to its final destination. <coughs> so after our visit, I decided, how are we going to use that process and optimize it in medicine? What can we do to make the rare common? What tools are out there to help us bridge the gap between the current state of medicine and the future state of medicine? With the help of our industry partnerships and Jim Reganor at Blockchain Resource Group, I explored the option of using blockchain in medicine. Now, many of you are probably wondering, or I hope it didn't lose you at this point, what is blockchain? Let me start with this simple analogy. Imagine a group of kids who are going outside to play basketball during recess. Each kid, at any moment in time, is probably going to know what the score of the game is. It's going to be very hard to convince them that the score isn't what it is. In blockchain, there, there are going to be nodes. Each node in a blockchain is going to have an exact copy of the ledger. In this case, think of the origin of the ledger coming from the Jacobs Institute. And the information in those ledgers would be design files for our 3D printed models that medical device manufacturers, physicians, and hospital systems could use to train on. So if blockchain can bridge the gap between the current state of medicine and the future state of medicine, I have identified three market areas in which this technology could be disruptive. Device development, physician training, and surgical planning. Right now, we see device development and physician training being two major areas for market because the JI has a lot of experience there. We then see surgical planning as the next best option, but we need to improve our technology and continue to work with our industry partners to learn more about the technology and how it will be beneficial. So as you can see, all the things that my peers have done and they have exhibited today we are going to disrupt the current state of medicine. We are going to make a better tomorrow. Maya has showed us that through the data, there's a need. Tom, Liam, and Kristen can show, shows us that our models can be improved and more lifelike. And Dave shows us that our 3D printing capabilities can be improved and become more seamless. I'd like to reiterate, it is here it is now. We are a part of something bigger, and I am excited to see how I can contribute to the future of medicine. With the help of this building, my peers, technology, partnerships, and passion for what we do, we are going to create a better tomorrow. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to um, have my, the rest of my colleagues come up for the question and answer portion of the afternoon. I think one of the great things about this internship is that each of the projects that we were given are all needs that needed to be addressed here at the Jacobs Institute. So from the beginning, there was always the opportunity for us to continue on with our projects. 
For example, I am graduating this summer from UB, so I'm hoping to stay here and continue to do some of the work I've been doing. I know we all have the hope that we can still keep our hands on our projects and help them move forward, but these are by no means the ends of our projects. <laughs> I also think one of the, uh, the most important things we did was we were able to provide an avenue to make introductions to different you know, sectors of industry, whether it be partner with Flexible Robotic Environment or Moog, we kind of initiated those relationships that the JI might not have had the, the resources or the time or the manpower to do, you know, if we weren't here to kind of get that started. So I think we're on our way. Allison Kupferman. I'm the Communications and Community Outreach Manager for the Jacobs Institute, and I've had the extreme fortune of working with the interns this summer. Um, as you can see, they've done an exceptional job both with their projects and obviously preparing for the presentation. Um, we did have a, the bubbles. bubbles. We did have um, about 45 applicants this year, um, so our applicant pool continues to grow. Making these decisions to pick, you know, a couple of interns extremely hard, um, and as you can see, we wound up with the cream of the crop here. Um, now, our interns are forever a part of the Jacobs Institute family. Um, we actually had a reunion uh, this year, which was our five-year reunion, so we've been doing this now for five years, um, and we had a great turnout, and I think it was a great opportunity for these interns to sort of connect with um, past interns and see where they've all gone on to, whether it's uh, Johnson & Johnson or um, you know, Prestige Universities, um, Apple, uh, so the, you know, the, the future is definitely limitless for this group. These six interns came at a really special time at the Jacobs Institute um, with the release of the future of medicine within the last year and the launch of our I2R. So this was definitely the right and the ripe time for them to be here and of course they're taking everything to the next level. So without further ado, let's go celebrate them and their projects across the way and we've also got um, some of their projects on display that they can show you in our training lab and, and some items here as well. So congratulations guys, you did it! <laughs> 